Hello, um, uh, my name's Nev Pierce. I'm editor at large for Empire Magazine, and I'm here to say as little as possible <laughs> and let this man do all the talking. Um, before you got into writing professionally, there's this little period of time where you worked uh, on political campaigns, is that correct? And how did you get involved in that? It's not a, a clear trajectory like, I did this, then I worked in politics, then I did this. So in the midst, of, around the same time I was writing that first play, my best friend, a guy named Jay Carson, he's the character, uh, the character Stephen in Ides of March and Fair Get North is based on him. He was, he was having this meteoric rise that already began in college, and he said, uh, I'm working on the Senate campaign, uh, why don't you come work on it? And I did, and I had a blast. It was an amazing experience. We were all over the state, you know, a couple 20-year-old guys uh, feeling like in our own infinitesimal way we were, we were gonna make a difference and make history, and we won that race. Uh, and it was uh, amazing. I mean, there's very few things in life where you know on a particular day, at a particular time, whether you have succeeded or failed. And an election is one of those things. And it's, uh, as I learned at that time, such a rush, such a high when you win, and as I learned later, so crushing when you lose. It's very black and white. Uh, but we won, and I wanted more, uh, and that led to uh, Hillary Clinton's Senate race in 2000, and Bill Bradley's presidential in 2000, and ultimately Howard Dean's presidential in 2004, which is the last campaign I've ever worked on, I, I guess over 10 years ago now. Um, and I drew from all those experiences to write Farragut and write uh, and continue to draw on them to write House of Cards. But politics was uh, never like a, a thing for me. I'm not a political junkie. I, I, I've written 12 plays and only one of them has to do with politics. And you know, the reason you guys probably showed up is because of House of Cards. And, and so the two things that I'm most known for, uh, Farragut North and Ides of March uh, on the one hand and House of Cards on the other, both are you know, in the world of politics. But I, that's not a subject that interests me. Um, power, no, it, no, no, it, it, uh, I'm not trying to be cavalier here. Power really interests me. And politics is a subset of power. And politics in Washington at this level, you're seeing power explored in the most sophisticated ways with the highest stakes. But I'm just as interested and fascinated by the power uh, relationship within the marriage between Frank and Claire Underwood which is the real subject of the show, not politics, if that makes sense. Yeah. So can we talk a little bit about how, how closely Farragut uh, was to your own experience or your friend's experience, but also then the experience of seeing that staged, and then I can't imagine what it's like to get a phone call from George Clooney or Clooney's people saying, <laughs> hey, we think you've got something here, we'd like to make a movie. I had never, the most that I'd ever had with that play is uh, a staged reading. Uh, before I got the call from Warner Brothers that they wanted to turn it into a movie. It had never been on stage. In fact, I'd sent it to 40 theaters around the country. I didn't have an agent at the time. And uh, those that got back to me uh, rejected it, and most didn't even get back to me. So I put that play away, and I began working on subsequent plays. And when I got the call, uh, it was because, you know, and I won't go into all the details, after I wrote that play, I managed to get an agent, and that agent read my work and said, I want to send this play out. I said, good luck, I've sent it everywhere. But he, he sent it out, he immediately got some interest from uh, Broadway theater producers, which was crazy, because I'd never had a single production of anything. But based on that, uh, my agent felt encouraged enough to send it out to, to, uh, send it out to Hollywood just as a writing sample, uh, in the hopes that I might get some meetings and maybe get like a staffing job on a TV show or something. But somehow, in the way that these things happen in their magical way, it ended up at a, a junior executive's desk at Warner Brothers who read it. Uh, he was about my age. He immediately gave it to his boss, a guy named Kevin McCormick, uh, who was uh, an executive at Warner Brothers for many years and a brilliant guy. Um, and uh, he had a discretionary fund. So he could just put something in development without having to go to anyone else. And we got a call saying, we'd like to turn this play into a movie, and George Clooney and Leo DiCaprio want to produce. <laughs> Remember, I'd never had a production of a play. I was, I was temping at a place in Rockefeller Plaza where my job was to staple things and put them in the mail. <laughs> 
And I said, let me think about it. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll get back to you next week. No, I, I, I chat myself, and then when I cleaned that up, uh, we, you know, I, I went out to LA and I, I met with, um, you know, George's people, uh, and eventually George and and Leo and and the Warner Brothers folks, and it was happening, you know. So rewiring my brain to that, which was totally new for me, was hard, but also thrilling. And I did a few drafts, and then I turned it over to George Clooney and Grant Heslop, and they worked off those drafts and did their drafts. And at, at the point I handed it off, my work was done. It was very much at that point going to be George's movie. I mean, he was directing it, he was in it, he had pulled together the cast, which was an amazing cast, and he had found the financing, and he had wrested it away from Warner Brothers uh, to get it uh, distributed by Sony, which never, I mean, it's very difficult to wrest a property away from one studio for it to go to another, so it's very much his thing. And, um, and they did their work, and they changed a lot, and, I, and a lot of the screenplay for that movie is them. And, uh, and I was fine with that because I knew they understood the core of the story and they didn't want to mess with that. And that was this young man uh, at this fork in the road having this great sort of ethical choice before him. And he chooses one direction or another and, it, and the moment he chooses this direction is the moment he becomes a monster. And it's that moment of becoming a monster which I wanted to arrive at. And that is what they achieved, I think, in the film uh, in a way that was very different from the play. And they got beautiful performances out of, uh, out of everyone. Uh, and I'm very proud of, of the work that we all did, but particularly grateful to George for being so passionate about it and making it happen. Because those sort of movies, I mean, look around. They're not getting made anymore. Uh, certainly, well, at least not in America as much. Um, if you don't have a comic book hero, um, good luck, you know? And, uh, and so, I mean, all in all, for me, it was an incredibly positive experience, and it opened up, it opened up that door that I got my pinky toe into, and, uh, you know, I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that I, I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for a number of people, Kevin McCormick, the junior exec that worked for him, George Clooney, Grant Hessoff, all the actors that said yes to that film, the people that put the money into it. If it weren't for all of those people taking a chance on this piece of material by someone who had no credits whatsoever, uh, then you know I'd, I'd, I'd still be stapling stuff and mailing it. So you had Farragut North, and you get the call about doing the movie, but then you get you know BAFTA and Oscar nominated, and then a call about House of Cards. So you've written for a stage, you've then written for the big screen. Was there any hesitancy then by going, well, now I've got to learn how to write for television, and is that much of a different experience? Um, yeah, again, it's a little messy, because it's not that linear. Uh, the way I'd gotten that agent, which is how Ides of March happened, is I, by writing a pilot for AMC. Uh, AMC is the network that did Mad Men and Breaking Bad and um, uh, Walking Dead. Uh, but when I got the gig, they were just starting. And uh, a good friend of mine, Sam Foreman, had had a really good meeting with them. He had an agent. He was, he had had shows pr uh, produced on the stage. And they had said to him, uh, we love your spec script. We're looking for three things as we start this new venture of original content. We're looking for period pieces, uh, espionage pieces, or smart horror. Um, <laughs> And do you have any of those things? And Sam said, I do not. And they said, come back when you do. And he said, OK. And then Sam and I went for a drink. And he said, do you have any uh, ideas for period, espionage, or smart horror? And I said, what the fuck is smart horror? He's like, I have no idea. <laughs> I guess it's The Walking Dead, right? Um, but, but we're like, OK, we don't, we don't know what smart horror is. So our best bet here is espionage or period. <laughs> Uh, and then there was a few screenplays that I wrote. One, uh, one was a blind script for Warner Brothers that was part of the Ides of March deal. I, I hubristically tried to tackle Tale of Two Cities. I was like the sixth writer in 20 years to try to make that happen for Warner Brothers. And I think I wrote a good script. And I think the five scripts before me were also really good. They just they couldn't commit. 
Um, and then I wrote a couple other screenplays and that didn't get made. And, um, and I was sort of at this moment where I go, well, I had this movie that George Clooney made and got nominated for this stuff. And I got my foot in the door. And now I've had three scripts that haven't gotten made. I mean, it may be ending. I mean, you know, that you can only write so many scripts that don't get made before people stop hiring you to write scripts. Uh, and it was right at that moment that Fincher called and said, have you heard of this thing called House of Cards? Uh, they want to make a TV show. And I'd heard of it, because if you write anything about politics, at some point, someone's going to say, did you watch House of Cards? Um, and at that time, they meant just you know, the BBC version. Ours didn't exist. Uh, so I'd been meaning to watch it anyway. And I, uh, I figured, well, Fincher's one of the great living filmmakers. And within like 10 seconds, you realize when you're talking to David Fincher that you're dealing with uh, the sort of mind that you may never encounter again. I mean, he has a savant-like knowledge of the craft and the history of filmmaking. Uh, he is uh, incredibly clever and witty, but also concise and deep and blunt and profound in his thinking about art. Uh, he, his, his synapses fire faster than just about anyone I know. Uh, and I just felt through the phone like I was dealing with this life force that I wanted to tap into, I wanted to hold on to and, and work with and be around. And we started talking about House of Cards and you know, we had similar instincts on the approach to it and we were starting to come up with new ideas on the fly and it just became clear that like, I, I had to do this. Uh, we're going to open to questions from the audience in a couple of minutes. Um, I just wanted to ask... I'll be quick. I'm sorry, Nev. No, no, it's good. I mean, I, I shouldn't have prepared so much. Um, <laughs> I, I could have gone to the pub. Yeah. Um, structure. So you have the structure of a play, you have the structure of a film. How does the structure differ when you're doing television, or does it differ that much, given that it's not really TV, you know, it's oh, yeah. everything's dropping at the same time, I never 13 episodes? Your question, really, yeah. Uh, well, for me, TV is a lot closer to the theater, because there's an ongoing dialogue with the actors and the, the department heads. Like, I mean, you, you, it's like you have this crew and this family that you're spending a lot of time with and, and discovering things with, as you would in the rehearsal process for a play. Um, and something that you discover in, say, episode two, even though you've planned out the whole season, might influence scripts to come and have this ripple effect. And so there's a, there's a lot more dialogue uh, between the collaborators going back and forth um, than I think you have on a film where most of the time you have the script and then the director takes it and directs it. There's also the, the fact that you, know, you have, in a, just one season, for us, 13 hours. Uh, a, a, a film, a movie, is much more like a, a short story or a poem. Like, the, not a moment or line can be wasted. Like, it, it, it has to resolve itself in 90 to 120 minutes. And uh, with a television show, it doesn't. I mean, each hour or chapter, whatever you want to call it, um, is a discrete thing that has its own beginning, middle, and an end to a degree. But it doesn't have to completely resolve itself. I mean, it could actually end in a place of total lack of resolution, but the feeling you're heading somewhere. Uh, so you can really take your time with the storytelling. You can, I think, dive into character in ways that are impossible to do in film or even a stage play uh, because uh, you have the hours to do it. And in that way, I think it's closest to a novel more than anything else. Um, which is also how people are watching it, too, these days. Uh, they're sort of picking it up and putting it down when they want to and choosing how many chapters they want to read. Or, um, and you have no control over that, the same way the novelist doesn't have any control over you know, whether you read their novel on the train or in your living room in one sitting or over the course of many months. Um, so you know, the approach that Fincher wanted to take and that I guess we, we I mean, I didn't know any better. I mean, none of us had made TV. Not, we didn't really know what we were doing. But um, we just figured, OK, well, we'll make a movie that just happens to be 13 hours long. Um, and I can't describe to you what that means, other than that's what we tried to do. And I think that's what a season is for us. Um, so we don't really think about episodes as much as we think about 
this, the movie. And we just have a, a lot longer movie and more time to play with than the typical film. So um, if, uh, we have a couple of roving mics. So if you have a question, can you stick your hand in the air? Uh, let's start over here. In House of Cards, season one, and I think episode eight or nine, Francis offers Doug to uh, teach him how to play chess. My question is, would he Doug fared much better if he'd taken up that yeah. offer. Or <laughs> well, sort of more generally speaking, and how far is chess maybe an organizing principle to the entire show? I believe when Francis offered to teach Stamper how to play chess, uh, uh, Claire had disappeared uh, off to New York to be with Adam Galloway, and he was feeling sort of in this restless purgatory. And uh, Stamper, if anything, is, a, is functional. It's about control. It's about um, uh, getting things done in a very practical way. And he's, he, he wasn't, certainly not in season one, equipped, I think, to deal with the emotional um, limbo that his boss was in. So better to just get away. <laughs> um, I don't, I've never thought about it in terms of would he have fared better if he had learned how to play chess. Um, I don't know, uh, maybe. I mean, chess is, and this bleeds into your second question, I guess. I mean, ch chess to me is, is, is fascinating. I mean, I, I, I wrote a play about Garry Kasparov's match against Deep Blue in 1997. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not even an amateur chess player. I mean, I, I can hold my own, I guess, with the average player out there. Uh, but it, it's vast, I mean, it, it's, I think, I mean, I read that there were more possible games of chess than there are particles in the universe. Um, and when you study someone like a Garry Kasparov, that was actually someone I brought up a lot in my early conversations with Fincher. Um, what's interesting about Kasparov and the reason he's one of the greatest players of all time is not because of his strategy or tactics. It's not that he's thinking 15 moves ahead. It's that he's creating chaos on the board. Uh, he will sacrifice two pieces for seemingly no reason whatsoever uh, with not necessarily a concrete plan on how to get back that capital. But he knows that the person on the other side of the table is saying, why did he just do that? He must have some grand plan. He must be thinking 15 moves ahead. And at that level with grandmasters, it's about, it's like tennis. Who makes the first mistake? So if I know I'm willingly making this mistake, but what I get back is I'm psychologically throwing off the other guy who will make a bigger mistake, then, it, then it's worth it. And that's something we, we, we use all the time with Frank Underwood, you know, to steal one of the lines from the show. If you don't like the way the table is set, turn over the table. Um, and something that Fincher and I talked a lot about was that politics is not about, it's, it's not a symphony, it's jazz. Uh, it is call and response. It is reaction. The great politicians might plan out 15 steps ahead, but they'll get to step two and everything changes. There's some crisis. There's some unexpected thing. There, there is the chaos of the world. And at that moment, you have to get rid of the next 13 steps and you have to react to that and develop a new plan that you know will the next day probably be thrown out the window because of new chaos introducing itself. And it's how do you manage that chaos and make it work for you? How do you play jazz with it? Uh, that really makes the great politicians great. Um, and then the very best politicians know how to create chaos and make it work for them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess in that respect, uh, yeah, I'm not thinking about chess all the time as I write House of Cards, but there's certainly plenty of parallels to be drawn. Does that metaphor hold true for the process of actually writing the show as well? Of kind of, you may be thinking, oh, this is going to happen in episode oh, yeah. 13, but all the things time. change. Totally. Um, I mean, from, from creative discoveries to things that are simply out of our control. Um, creative discoveries might be something like in season one, Peter Russo's character was a big character, but never intended to be the guy who ran for governor. That was a whole other character. But Corey Stahl was so great. And when we saw him on the screen with Kevin, 
we all felt just we want to see more of that. I mean, that, that's lightning in a bottle that we've caught that you don't want to let that lightning go. So uh, I made a huge shift in the middle of filming the season where I took this other character's story who was running for governor and I gave it to Peter Russo. Now that's not just about changing whose name is above the dialogue. That required page one rewrites from episode five onwards. But it was in response to this discovery we had made and it was totally worth it because um, it actually made Peter Russo's story stronger. It consolidated the story for the season. So we were really focusing on this one guy as opposed to two. Um, and you know, it, it worked for us. There are other instances where um, you, know, uh, you might lose an actor. I mean, in the States, uh, you can have series regular deals. Um, and forgive me for being a little jargony here. Uh, but a series regular deal means that you basically own the actor. They're, you have them in first position. They can't do anything else unless they get permission from you. But there's a lot of characters that you don't have in first position because you can't afford it. So they might be in a, lot, in a fair number of episodes and you kind of count on their existence, but they get some big offer from another thing and boom, they're gone. And then you've, you've built this story around this person that is no longer available to you. Um, you have no choice but to change your story and react to it. Uh, so I'm not going to name names, but I mean th that has happened before for us. Uh, and uh, you know, look, <laughs> here's a, a tiny one. It, it wasn't global, but um, you know, you you guys remember in season one, episode nine, I think, the where Francis says, "I I despise children." There, I said it. And in the beginning of that episode. Uh, he's talking about stuff with Peter Russo. Russo's kids are running around. One of Russo's kids knocks some coffee and it burns his hand. And he's like, ah, I despise children. There, I said it. And then the rest of the episode, you see him wearing a bandage. Um, well, Kevin had actually injured his hand. And there was this bandage there. And we didn't want to deal with having to shoot everything where we were hiding this hand. So I created that opening to the show so that we could justify him wearing a bandage. But then I'm like, well, I might as well make the most of it. Let's have him say he despises children. You know, and it's one of my favorite direct addresses. But that's just, you know, that's the chaos of the world, you know. Firstly, about The Eyes of March, which is a film I love very much and fortunately saw it in New York. And it was a really fantastic experience for us when it came out. Um, you touched slightly on your uh, your research, which obviously for that came from your experience. So firstly, what tools do you use for researching for other things, um, uh, other projects? And the other aspect is about the male and the female voice within your work as a writer. So um, within the eyes of March, even though it was quite a male heavy film, you had very strong female voices. And this is also existent within House of Cards. How do you, as a male writer, write so well for women? Um, well, thank you for, for liking Eyes of March and for the compliment you paid me at the end uh, about writing well for women. I mean, I, uh, I'll start with the second part first, which is that um, it's not just me writing well for women, it's also the women I employ on my writing staff, you know, which is an important thing to do if you are going to have female characters in your show. Uh, that said, I don't. I, I really am against the notion that the female writers should write the female characters and the male writers should write the male characters. Um, I, I mean, what is writing if not the attempt to put yourself in other people's shoes? So uh, I expect my female writers to be able to write men well uh, to the best of their ability and, and vice versa. Um, now, we're all limited by our own experiences. Uh, there are certain things I will never be able to access because of things that are genetic, things that are in my upbringing, uh, things that are cultural. Um, we all have our limited horizons and often our unconscious biases. Um, but I think writing is an attempt to um, acknowledge those and, and sometimes get beyond them and find the universal in all of our experiences. So we, the way we approach writing men and women on House of Cards, um, it's paradoxical. On the one hand, we want to be gender blind. I mean, there's, there's no, all the characters are equally intelligent and venal. 
Um, and I mean, Balzac's one of my favorite writers because the women in his stories are just as insidious as everyone else. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, you know, we're looking for the strength and also the weakness in every character. And you know, there's a term that is, I don't know if it's used here often, but certainly in the States, like strong female characters. I take a little bit of issue with strong female characters as though, um, you know, why do you have to put the word strong in front of it? You know, I mean, there are strong male characters and weak male characters. There are strong female characters and weak female characters. There are strong and weak trans characters. You can kind of look at a spectrum, and, and on one end of the spectrum is uh, misogyny and neglect. Misogyny, we all know what that means, but there's a, a sort of indirect form of misogyny, which is like the absence of female characters or, or, or substantial storylines for them, um, or that they're just relegated to their body or just to their relationship to a man, right? So that's one end of the spectrum, and that's bad. The other end of the spectrum is uh, trying to place women on some sort of pedestal, um, you know, trying to make them uh, these sort of goddesses uh, or fantasies, um, and, uh, and, and almost trying too hard to make them strong, you know, which is, which is another way actually of neglecting the complexity of their lives. Uh, so if you avoid those two ends and just say, well, we're just going to say this character, man or woman, has a need. <coughs> What is that thing that they need, and what are they do, willing to do to, to get that need? Then, uh, then you can begin to, I think, address gender in a sophisticated way. Obviously, there are certain things that are different in the human experience between men and women. If Frank Underwood were having perimenopausal hot flashes, that would be strange. Like that's not an experience a guy's going to have. Um, it is an experience that women can and will have. Uh, so we told that story for Claire in part in season one, but here's the big thing. That wasn't her, her story. That was part of her life. But it, if we had said this is her story and her story is only one that is relegated to something that's gender specific, then th we would have been reductive with her. But if we're just telling the story of Claire Underwood and it so happens because she's this age, that this is something she's going through, then we're just being realistic. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's that's how we try to approach it. Um, and then the first part of your the first oh research. Uh, so for House of Cards, uh, it's a mixture of book learning of experts. Jay Carson, the guy I talked about earlier, uh, is our political consultant. If he doesn't know something, he puts us in touch with people that are. Um, it's my own personal experience, and it's also my writer's own personal experience. And, and oftentimes, the research is not so much political. It's drawing from, you know, you could see something happen on a sidewalk, uh, like a man screaming, you know, um, a homeless man screaming on a sidewalk. That's research. If you absorb it, if it means something to you, if you find yourself using it and colliding it with your character. You know, so I think it's about being open. On other subject matter, like, the, like Gary Kasparov, I mean, uh, same, same thing. I mean, I, I, it's really project specific, but it's, you know, you, you, the, the adage, write what you know, I think is a very wise one. Uh, but uh, also, it's important to write what you don't know, if only to discover the things that you know that you didn't know. Cheers. Uh, hello. Um, I nearly got in, well, I got into NYU Tisch earlier this year to do a uh, master's in screenwriting. Uh, but at the same time, I got an agent, um, and two of my scripts got picked up. Um, and I'm developing a, one of them now, which is a sitcom, um, which is kind of a weird experience. I don't really know what I'm doing. But um, I'm just asking you, uh, is there any advice you can give for the next steps that I'm in? Because it's all based around uncertainty, and I have really no idea apart from the you know, ideas that I have in my head about what I'm creating. Um, yeah, is there any advice? Uh, 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 the only real advice I could give is to do the work. I mean, I, I, uh, you know, I, I always struggle when writers ask for advice because 
you know, there's no formula. I mean, congrats on getting an agent, and congrats on NYU. It's a great school, and I mean, it sounds like you are you are creating the opportunities for yourself that are beginning to pay off. Um, and and you know, a big part of uh, any form of success in any industry is is you know, looking for opportunities and then making opportunities if they're not being laid at your feet. And that can be school. It could be going out and making your own film on your own. Uh, it, it, it can be, uh, you know, if no one is doing any of your pilots, writing a play and doing that with your friends, uh, you know, no one can stop you from that. There's a million ways to create opportunities for yourself. But ultimately, all of that is only there if you've got the pages. The only thing you can do that is completely in your control and that ultimately will make you successful, uh, at least financially or, or, or whatever, um, as a form of success, uh, although the real success has nothing to do with that, but um, is, is having the pages and putting in the time and the thousands of hours and thousands of pages you must write. Uh, I, I, I don't think that... Um, talking about what you're writing counts. I don't think thinking about what you want to write counts. I think the only thing that counts is the actual writing. Um, so, you know, if you've got a sitcom that's getting some traction, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of strategic things that, you know, if we sat down for an hour and talked about, you know, this agent is doing this and going to this studio, and there's all that bullshit that's, you know, the, the strategically. Um, but no matter what happens, you're either going to be making your show, in which case it's not about buying a new car and you know um, going to all the clubs. It's about you got to put your shoulder to the wheel even more, or you're not going to make your show, in which case the only thing that you can do is write the next one, and then write the next one and then write the next one, and then write the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and never stop until you die. <laughs> you know, my first thought, my first thought, I shit you not, my first thought every day when I wake up, like my mantra, as soon as I have the ability to have a conscious thought, it's I will die. Right, which sounds morbid, but it's not. To me, it's completely liberating because it can't get worse from there. Like, you, you have that thought and you go, okay, um, let's get to work, you know? So uh, that's a piece of advice too. Just remember that every day when you wake up. Puts, puts things in perspective. That seems like a wonderful moment <laughs> on which to end our evening. Thank you so much for coming. Because all that mattered was the story, nothing else. Not your ego, not your training, not your ambitions. This story is all I care about, you know. Uh, we were in this production office in, in Dublin and I, I, I went upstairs and I borrowed somebody's computer and I, I wrote the scene um, in probably 30 minutes 